that must also be something you must see on a fairly regular basis. Do you want to answer that? <laughs> well, that's a, that's a tall question as well, I think. Um, I, I look at it as what is the um, individual's concept of God, you know? And so does someone see God as this sort of, you know, male patriarch handing down punishment in the world? I don't see it that way. And so I look at it as a much broader uh, perspective that God is part of all of us and that energy to, towards our higher self is what we want to sort of tap into at that time and see what do we feel, what is our expression, what is our inner feeling about that. Mm -hmm. And, and not look to sort of create some entity outside in which to blame. You know, you know in his book, um, let me see if I can recall it, For Those Who Can't Believe, uh, mm -hmm. Rabbi Gelberman talked about um, the role of uh, transformation in loss and in anger and in disappointment. That if we just stay in the situation itself, there is no hope. The hope in it is mm -hmm. in finding a way to transform the experience into something of meaning. And I, I can imagine that as a spiritual counselor, you would, you would draw from the various traditions, maybe to, you mentioned different perspectives, being able to provide different perspectives. Maybe mm -hmm. that. We try very hard as interfaith ministers to educate ourselves to the different faith traditions and what the particular teachings are and the particular practices are so that as people come to us, we can recommend to them practices and, and techniques that they're comfortable with already, not that they have to learn anything new, mm. but just for them to realize that these are tools for them to use. And I think, I think that they're much more willing to use those things today. Uh, things have changed. Before, people used to feel very bound by their faith traditions. The, the, they felt that the traditions were telling them what they had to do and what they had to believe. And they've broken out of that the last 20 or 30 years. People are wanting to take much more responsibility for gaining their own wisdom. And the, pop, the very positive side to that is that even when they have problems now, yes, there's a part of you that says, why me, and why is God doing this to me? But the other side of it says, oh, but I can do something about this. I can attune myself to uh, spiritual principles that work, that help us to live successful lives, and I can make a change in my own life. And so these days I see people really getting down to business, really working. They know that they have tools available to them, and if they can find the ones that just sort of fit them like a glove, you know, whatever faith tradition practices fit just right for them, they can take those tools and, through personal growth, really go with it. What happens if somebody comes to you that has no prior history of a faith tradition? I don't, first of all, I guess, why would they come? I don't know why say, they would come. But let's yeah. say uh, they had tried other things that didn't work, and at some level they knew there was something missing. But because they didn't have a childhood faith, mm -hmm. they weren't even sure what that thing, what you would call that thing. They mm -hmm. just had a sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Again, I think because we are naturally spiritual beings, whether we've ever been taught outwardly that we are or not, something inside tells us that we are. We know there's more to us than that. And so at some point, even feeling great despair that there is nowhere to go, something in us says, but I know there's got to be something more. I've got to find out what it is. I don't know what it's called. I've never felt it. I don't know the name for it, but something is out there. And you know, just in having that sense of yearning, you begin to draw that which you need to know. And little by little, you'll find a person, a book, a class, a teaching, a teacher. It goes on and on. The deeper your desire to know, the more quickly you'll draw that information into your life. Yeah, there does seem to be that openness. What is that uh, statement, Doug, uh, when the student is ready, the teacher well, appears? Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree with what Bhavani said. I think that um, people, everyone has probably had an experience that's been a feeling or a sensation of something, some higher self within them, and that's what we would need to appeal to. You know, you must remember that even the atheist spends more time thinking about God than we do. That's very <laughs> true. <laughs> Actually, it takes just as much faith to not believe in God, doesn't it? <laughs> um, the other one was the, and we sort of alluded to this, to help to find new or renewed meaning in life. So maybe people coming to you, I would guess, in a time of transition, mm -hmm. you know, where um, the first part of their lives they were doing certain things in certain ways, 
and they can feel it no longer fits them, but maybe they need some sort of spiritual guidance to look at another direction? Would that be something that people might want to talk about? It also opens them up to the desire for fellowship among people who think the same way. And so if in the past it's been kind of bleak for them, personally and with the people around them, I find that once that interest starts and they would come and make a connection with people uh, such as Doug and myself, then the next step is, oh, well, I want to meet the other people out there who feel the same way or think the same way. And they begin to feel like part of something. And this is a very, very great compensation and um, an inspiration to them to continue now with their own spiritual growth. Well, that whole issue, I mean, I, I've heard, I've read various writers, and I absolutely believe it's true that isolation is, you know, the major epidemic, mm -hmm. um, uh, being disenfranchised, alienation. I mean, I think it, it's profoundly beneath most of the difficulties I see even in my office. I mean, you can call it depression, anxiety, mm -hmm. a lot of things, um, but, you know, child, but really what it's about is that lack of connection. That lack is. Of connection. Where's my place in the world? Where mm -hmm. do I, who do I belong to? Who are my people? Um, and I think that's very painful for people to maybe to feel that sort of floating around in no place in the world. It's devastating. People suffer more from that than anything else. I, I believe I've read more than once how Mother Teresa uh, from India has said repeatedly, and acknowledging the great poor, the poorness in India, but she still says the people in the West are much more poor because they're spiritually poor. They don't have that sense of connection. And she feels more for us here than, uh, because of that lack than for the people who are physically poor in India. Well, and I, I think it's, it's a truth that you can get through a lot of things in life, um, a lot of difficult things in life, uh, when you feel support or you feel, you know, you're when not you have that inner strength, you yeah. can get through anything. Let's take a look at a couple other issues that could come up for people when they call upon you. Feeling distance from their faith and confused about it, or unresolved feelings of anger at God, which blocks personal healing. Let's take a look at this first one in terms of distance from their faith. I see an awful lot of people who have sort of a childhood memory of a very punitive faith. And that what happens in recovery, uh, particularly if you go through a 12-step model of recovery, is it talks a great deal about connecting with a higher power. Um, and people feel sometimes very resistant to doing that. Because what they, what they pull upon is this childhood source of guilt and uh, punishment and feeling less than. Um, and so mm -hmm. they're very distanced from it and don't want to have anything to do with it. Mm -hmm. I think that also ties in with what we were just talking about, the commitment to family and extended family. And more and more during the 60s and 70s as people sort of got away and became more individuated and um, were sort of rebelled against those punitive trainings as, as when they were younger, that they now need to sort of forgive themselves, forgive the um, situation, you know, for having been in that situation and, and move a little bit beyond that and, and look at um, what, what is the higher self and what is their relationship to it. I think often if someone is involved in community or is involved with an extended family, uh, that that's, there's much more hope from those um, circumstances to realize that it's possible. Hmm. Well, it also occurs to me as you were talking, um, uh, Tav Sparks in his book, The Wide Open Door, which I know you're familiar with, uh, talks about the importance of a dark place spiritually. That, that at some level, we, 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 come, we come at a point of um, needing to let go of some of those past ideas. But that there is a dark place in between, because if I'm mm -hmm. not defining my spirituality in the way I did as a child, until I've developed my new one, there is that period, I would imagine, of a lot of pain and confusion and doubt. There's a, lot, a big maturing process there, because in the beginning, I think the reason people feel upset about their childhood training, often they call themselves recovering this or that, mm -hmm. it's because the faith tradition was presented to them as a, a set of rules and regulations, and either they couldn't or wouldn't uh, meet those rules and regulations and they had that sense of failure or not fitting in because they didn't and they thought oh well I guess I can't ever be a Catholic or a Jew or a Protestant or whatever but that's I believe that's only because the faith tradition wasn't presented to them in a deep enough way 
uh, to me, the rules and regulation part is more um, a surface thing, whereas underneath that, fa all faith traditions, all true faith traditions have a, a set of very effective spiritual practices. And I believe that if a faith tradition can be presented to a person at any age, from that level of spiritual practices where people can experience God's presence in whatever way that wants to come through, then they wouldn't necessarily feel that they have to throw the baby out with the bathwater. You know, any true faith tradition is much, much more than that little set of rules and regulations. It's a way of seeking God and knowing God. Which comes back to our earlier graphic of love and understanding transcend all dogma, which is a very underlying theme to many of the things that we discuss. And quite often the spiritual teacher that one might be attracted to is not the one responsible for the dogma that's come over the last several thousand or several hundred years. And so you need to make that differentiation and, and become aware of that, I think. Yeah, to make the separation in that the relationship with, um, with God or, um, as you said, a higher self is very different than rules. I mean, they really are two different, yes. different things. The last one, and we only have a couple of minutes, but the unresolved feelings of anger at God. Um, it's very scary, in my experience, for people to admit they're angry at God. In fact, and again, because I work in recovery, this is very common, someone mm -hmm. will finally confess, um, well, you're not supposed to be mad at God, but it's very obvious they are. Mm -hmm. You know, so coming to terms with, you know, that God, uh, their God um, is certainly big enough to tolerate that. Um, but being able to allow people to discuss their actual feelings um, must be an important part of what you do. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're in relationship with anyone, including in relationship with God, there's ups and downs and positive and negative aspects. And so I think often people need to, um, are always sort of working towards the middle way, you know, and finding the balance between that. And so, you know, you need to give, forgive everyone, you know, mm -hmm. forgive God as well for things mm -hmm. that you may have experienced in what may have been in the name of God, punitive upbringing and schools or exactly. whatever. Yeah. We're going to need to close, mm -hmm. but I want to thank you both for coming down and uh, sharing your insights into this topic. Um, I appreciate it. Thank you for joining us this evening. In the upcoming weeks, we'll explore international adoption and children of incarcerated parents. I'm Mary Crocker Cook. Good night. For topic suggestions, write